Here we go with the Oralinda again. We're starting on part five. If you're enjoying this content or you want to support me, if you sub, like, share, all that helps. I appreciate it greatly. We now come to the history of John. John, 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 Jean are all the same name, though the pronunciation, pronunciation varies, as the seamen like to shorten everything to be able to make it easier to call. John, that is, given, was a sea king born at Alberga, who sailed from the Flymere with a fleet of 127 ships fitted out for a long voyage, and laden with amber, tin, copper, cloth, linen, felt, otter skins, beaver, and rabbit skins. He would have also taken paper from here, but when he saw how Calta had destroyed the citadel, he became so angry that he went off with all his people to Flyburgt, and out of revenge set fire to it. His admiral and some of his people saved the lamp and the maidens, but they could not catch Sergiet or Kalta. She climbed up on the furthest battlement, and they thought she must be killed in the flames. But what happened? While all her people stood transfixed with horror, she appeared upon her steed more beautiful than ever, calling to them, To Kalta! Then the other Shelda people poured out towards her. When the seamen saw that, they shouted, We are for Minerva, from which arose a war in which thousands were killed. At this time, Rosamond, the mother, who had done all in her power by gentle means to preserve peace, when she saw how bad it was, made short work of it. Immediately she sent messengers through all the districts to call all the, a general levy, which brought together all the defenders of the country. The landsmen who were fighting were all caught, but John, with his seamen, took refuge on board his fleet, taking with him the two lamps, as well as Minerva and the maidens of both citadels. Helprick, the chief, summoned him to appear, but while all the soldiers were on the other side of the Scheldt, John sailed back to Flymere, and then straight to our islands. His fighting men and many of our people took women and children on board. And when John saw that he and his people would be punished for their misdeeds, he secretly took his departure. He did well for all our islanders and the other Scheldt people who had been fighting were transported to Britain. This step was a mistake, for now came the beginning of the end. Kalta, who people said could go as easily on the water as on the land, went to the mainland and on to Massilia, Marseille. Then came the Gauls out of the Mediterranean Sea with their ships to Cadiz and along all our coasts and fell upon Britain but they could not make any good footing there because the government was powerful and the exiles were still Frisians. But now came Kalta and said, you were born free and for small offenses have been sent away, not for your own improvement, but to get tin by your labor. If you wish to be free again and take my advice and live under my care, come away. I will pri provide you with arms and will watch over you. The news flew through the land like lightning, and before the carrier's wheel had made one revolution, she was mistress of all thri thriers in all our southern states as far as the Sin. She built herself a citadel on the high land to the north and called it Kaltasburg. It still exists under the name of Karanak. From this castle she ruled as a true mother against their will not for her followers but over them who were thenceforth called celts the gauls gradually obtained dominion over the whole of britain 
partly because they no longer had any citadel, secondly because they had their no Burkmakden, and thirdly because they had no real lamps. From all these causes the people could not learn anything. They were stupid and foolish, and having allowed the Gauls to rob them of their arms, they were led about like a bull with a ring in his nose. We shall now write how it fared with John. It is inscribed at Texland. Ten years after John went away, there arrived three ships in the Flymere. The people cried, Huzzah! What a blessing! And from their accounts, the mother had this written. When John reached the Mediterranean Sea, the reports of the Gauls had preceded him, so that on the nearest Italian coast he was nowhere safe. Therefore he went with his fleet straight over to Libya. There the black men wanted to catch them and eat them. At last they came to Tyr. But Minerva said, keep clear, for here the air has been long poisoned by the priests. The king was a descendant of Tiunus, as we were afterwards informed, but as the priests wished to have a king who, according to their ideas, was of long descent, they defied Tiunus to the vexation of his followers. <clears throat> After they had passed here, the Tyrians seized one of the rearmost ships, and as the ship was too far behind us, we could not take it back again, but John swore to be revenged for it. When night came, John bent his course towards the distant Crecolanden. At last they arrived at a country that looked very barren, but they found a harbor there. Here, said Minerva, we need not perhaps have any fears of princes or priests, as they always look out for rich fat lands. When they entered the harbor, there was not room for all the ships, and yet most of the people were too cowardly to go any further. Mm -hmm. And then John, who wished to get away, went with his spear and banner, calling to the young people to know who would volunteer to share his adventures. Minerva did the same thing, but she wished to remain there. The greater part stopped with Minerva. But the young sailors went with John. John took the lamp of Kalta and her maidens with him. Minerva retained her lamp and her own maidens. Between the rear and the distant coasts of Italy, John found some islands, which he thought desirable. Upon the largest, he built a city in the wood between the mountains. From the smaller islands, he made expeditions for vengeance on the Tyrians and plundered their ships and their lands. Therefore, these islands were called Insulae Piratarum, as well as Jonas, Insulae. When Minerva had examined the country, which is called by its inhabitants Attica, she saw that the people were all goat herds, and that they lived on meat, wild roots, herbs, and honey. They were clothed in skins, and had their dwellings on the slopes, Halinga, of the hills, wherefore they were called Halingers. At first they ran away, when they found that we did not attack them, they came back and showed great friendship. Minerva asked if we might settle there peaceably. This was agreed to on the condition that we should help them to fight against their neighbors, who came continually to carry away their children and to rob their dwellings. And then we built a citadel at an hour's distance from the harbor. By the advice of Minerva, it was called Athens because, she said, those who come after us ought to know that we are not here by cunning or violence, but we received as friends, Atha. While we were building the citadel, the principal personages came to see us, and when they saw that we had no slaves, it did not please them. And they gave her to understand it, as they thought that she was a princess. But Minerva said, how did you get your slaves? They answered, we bought some and took others in war. Minerva replied, if nobody would buy slaves, they would not steal your children, and you would have no wars about it. If 
you wish to remain our allies, you will free your slaves. The chiefs did not like this and wanted to drive us away, but the most enlightened of the people came and helped us to build our citadel, which was built of stone. This is the history of John and of Minerva. When they had finished their story, they asked respectfully for iron weapons, for, said they, our foes are powerful, but if we have good arms, we can withstand them. When this had been agreed to, the people asked if Freya's custom would flourish in Athens and on other parts of Greece, Krakalandan. The mother answered, if the distant Greeks belong to the direct descendants of Freya, then they will flourish. But if they do not descend from Freya, then there will be a long contention about it. Because the carrier must make 5,000 revolutions of this jewel before Fenda's people will be ripe for liberty. This is about the Greek Girtmen. When Hellenia or Minerva died, the priests pretended to be with us, and in order to make it appear so, they defied Hellenia. They refused to have any other mother chosen, saying that they feared there was no one among her maidens whom they could trust as they had trusted Minerva, surnamed Nihelenia. But we could not recognize Minerva as a goddess because she herself had told us that no one could be perfectly good except the spirit of Ralda. Therefore, we choose Girt, Tyre's daughter, for our mother. When the priests saw that they could not fry their herrings on our fire, have everything their own way, they left Athens and said that we refused to acknowledge Minerva as a goddess out of envy because she had shown so much affection to the natives. Thereupon they gave the people statues of her, declaring that they might ask of them whatever they liked, as long as they were obedient to her. By these kinds of tales, the stupid people were estranged from us, and at last they attacked us. But as we had built our stone city wall with two horns down to the sea, they could not get at us. Then, lo and behold, an Egyptian high priest, bright of eye, clear of brain, and enlightened of mind, whose name was Secrops, came to give them advice. When he saw that with his people he could not storm our wall, he sent messengers to Tyr. Thereupon there arrived three hundred ships full of wild mountain soldiers, which sailed unexpectedly into our haven while we were defending our walls. When they had taken our harbor, the wild soldiers wanted to plunder the village and our ships. One had already ravished a girl, but Secrops would not permit it, and the Tyrian sailors, who still had Frisian blood in their veins, said, If you do that, we will burn our ships, and you shall never see your mountains again. Secrops, who had no inclination towards murder or devastation, sent messengers to Girt. Requiring her, requiring her to give up the citadel, offering her free exit with all her live and dead property, and her followers the same. The wisest of the citizens, seeing that they could not hold the citadel, advised Geert to accept at once, before Secrops became furious and changed his mind. Three months afterwards, Geert departed with the best of Freya's sons and seven times twelve ships. Soon after they had left the harbor, they fell in with at least 30 ships coming from Tyre, with women and children. They were on their way to Athens, but when they heard how things stood there, they went with Girt. The sea king of the Tyrians brought them all together through the strait, which at the time ran into the Red Sea, and now reestablished as the Suez Canal. At last they landed at the Punjab, called in our language the Five Rivers, because five rivers flow together to the sea. Here they settled and called it Girtmania. The king of Tyre afterwards, seeing that all his best sailors were gone, 
sent all his ships with his wild soldiers to catch them dead or alive. When they arrived at the strait, both the sea and the earth trembled. The land was upheaved so that all the water ran out of the strait, and the muddy shores were raised up like a rampart. This happened on account of the virtu virtues of the Girtman, as everyone can plainly understand. In the year 1005, after Atland was submerged, this was inscribed on the eastern wall of Freiesburg. After 12 years had elapsed without our seeing any Italians in Almuland, there came three ships finer than any that we possessed or had ever seen. On the largest of them was a king of the Jonshin Islands, whose name was Ulysses, the fame of whose wisdom was great. To him a priestess had prophesied that he should become king of all Italy, provided he could obtain a lamp that had been lighted at the lamp in Texland. For this purpose, he had brought great treasures with him, above all, jewels for women more beautiful than had ever been seen before. They were from Troy, a town that the Greeks had taken. All these treasures he could offer to the mother, but the mother would have nothing to do with them. At last, when he found that there was nothing to be got from her, he went to Wahalagara, Walkcheren. There, there was established a Burkmagd, whose name was Kat but who's commonly called Kala, because her lower lip stuck out like a masthead. Here he tarried for years, to the scandal of all who, that knew it. According to the report of the maidens, he obtained a lamp from her, but it did him no good, because when he got to sea, his ship was lost, and he was taken up naked and destitute by another ship. There was left behind <clears throat> this king, a writer of pure Phrias blood, born in the new harbor of Athens, who wrote for us what follows about Athens, from which may be seen how truly the mother Helic spoke when she said that the customs of Phraia could never take firm hold in Athens. From the other Greeks, you will have heard a great deal of bad about Cecrops, because he was not in good repute. But I dare affirm that he was an enlightened man, very renowned both among the inhabitants and among us, for he was against oppression, unlike the other priests, and was virtuous, and knew how to value the wisdom of distant nations. Knowing that, he permitted us to live according to our own Eskebok. There was a story current that he was favorable to us because he was the son of a Frisian girl and an Egyptian priest. The reason of this was that he had blue eyes and that many of our girls had been stolen and sold to Egypt. But he never confirmed this. However it may have been, certain it is that he showed us more friendship than all the other priests together. When he died, his successor soon began to tear up our charters and gradually to enact so many unsuitable statutes that at long last, nothing remained of liberty but the shadow and the name. Besides, they would not allow the laws to be written so that the knowledge of them was hidden from us. Formerly, all the cases in Athens were pleaded in our language, but afterwards in both languages and at last in the native language only. At first, the men of Athens only married women of our own race, but the young men, as they grew up with the girls of the country, took them to wife. The bastard children of this connection were the handsomest and cleverest in the world, but they were likewise the wickedest, wavering between the two parties, paying no regard to laws or customs, except where they suited their own interests. As long as a ray of Freya's spirit existed, all the building materials were for common use and no one might build a house larger or better than his neighbors. But when some degenerate townspeople got rich by sea voyages and by the silver 
that their slaves got in the silver countries. They went out to live on the hills or in the valleys, where behind high enclosures of trees or walls, they built palaces with costly furniture. And in order to remain in good odeur with the nasty priests, they placed their likenesses of false gods and unchaste statues. Sometimes the dirty priests and princes wished for the boys rather than the girls and often led them astray from the paths of virtue by rich presidents, presents, or by force. Because riches were more valued by this lost and degenerate race than virtue or honor. One sometimes saw boys dressed in splendid flowing robes to the disgrace of their parents and maidens and to the shame of their own sex. If our simple parents came to general assembly at Athens and made compl complaints, a cry was raised, hear, hear, there is a sea monster going to speak. Such is Athens become like a morass in a tropical country full of leeches, toads, and poisonous snakes in which no man of descent habits can set, decent habits can set his foot. <clears throat> This is inscribed in all our citadels. Howard Denmark was lost to us 1,602 years after the submersion of Atland. Through the mad wantonness of Woden, Maggie had become master of the east part of Scandinavia. They dare not come over the hills and over the sea. The mother would not prevent it, she said. I see no danger in their weapons, but much in taking the Scandinavians back again, because they are so degenerate and spoilt. The General Assembly were of the same opinion, therefore it was left to him. A good hundred years ago, Denmark began to trade. They gave their iron weapons in exchange for gold ornaments, as well as for copper and iron ore. The mother sent messengers to advise them to have nothing to do with this trade. There was danger to their morals in it, and if they lost their morals, they would soon lose their liberty. But the Denmarkers paid no attention to her. They did not believe that they could lose their morals, therefore they would not listen to her. At last they were at a loss themselves for weapons and necessaries. And this difficulty was their punishment. Their bodies were brilliantly adorned, but their cupboards and their sheds were empty. Just 100 years after the first ship with provisions sailed from the coast, poverty and want made their appearance. Hunger spread her wings all over the country. Dissension marched proudly about the streets and into the houses. Charity found no place in unity departed. The child asked its mother for food. She had no food to give, only jewels. The women applied to their husbands. The husbands appealed to the courts. The courts had nothing to give, or if they had, they hid it away. Now the jewels must be sold. But while the sailors were away for that purpose, the frost came and laid a plank upon the sea and the strait the sound. When the frost had made the bridge, vigilance ceased in the land, and treachery took its place. Instead of watching on the shores, they put their horses in their sledges and drove off to Scandinavia. And then the Scandinavians, who hungered after the land of their forefathers, came to Denmark. One bright night they all came. Now, they said, we have a right to the land of our forefathers. And while they were fighting about it, the Fens came to the defenseless villages and ran away with the children. As they had no good weapons, they lost the battle, and with it, their freedom. And Maggie became master. All this was the consequence of their not reading Freya's texts and neglecting her counsels. There are some who think that they were betrayed by the counts and that the maidens had long suspected it. But if anyone attempted to speak about it, his mouth was shut by golden chains. 
We can express no opinion about it. We can only say to you, do not trust too much to the wisdom of your princes or of your maidens. But if you wish to keep things straight, everybody must watch over his own passions as well as the general welfare. Two years afterwards, Maggie himself came with a fleet of light boats to steal the lamp from the mother of Texan. This wicked deed he accomplished one stormy winter night, while the wind roared and the hail rattled against the windows. The watchman on the tower, hearing the noise, lighted his torch. As soon as the light from the tower fell upon the bastion, he saw that already armed men had got over the wall. He immediately gave the alarm, but it was too late. Before the guard was ready, there were 2,000 people battering the gate. The struggle did not last long, as the guards had not kept good watch. They were overwhelmed. While the fight was going on, a rascally Finn stole into the chamber of the mother and would have done her violence. She resisted him and threw him down against the wall. When he got up, he ran his sword through her. If you will not have me, you shall have my sword. A Danish soldier came behind him and cleaved his head in two. There came from it a streak of black blood and a wreath of blue flame. The Maggie had the mother nursed on his own ship. As soon as she was well enough to speak clearly, the Maggie told her that she must sail with him, but that she should keep her lamp and her maidens and should hold a station higher than she had ever done before. Moreover, he said that he should ask her, in presence of all his chief men, if she would become the ruler of all the country and people of Freya, that she must declare and affirm this, or he would let her die a painful death. Then, when he gathered all his chiefs around her bed, he asked in a loud voice, Frana, since you are a prophetess, shall I become ruler over all the lands of and people of Freya? Frana did as if she took no notice of him, but at last she opened her lips and said, My eyes are dim, but the other light dawns upon my soul. Yes, I see it. I hear Ertha and rejoice with me. At the time of the submersion of Atland, the first spoke of the jewel stood at the top. After that it went down and our freedom with it. When two spokes or two thousand years shall have rolled down, the sons shall arise who have been bred of the fornication of the princes and priests with the people and shall witness against their fathers. They shall all fall by murder but what they have proclaimed shall endure and shall bear fruit in the bosom of able men, like good seed which is laid upon thy lap. Yet a thousand years shall the sp spoke descend and sink deeper in the darkness and in the bloodshed over you by the wickedness of the princes and priests. After that, the dawn shall bring begin to glow when they perceive this, the false princes and priests will strive and wrestle against freedom. But freedom, love, and unity will take the people under their protection and rise out of the vile pool. The light which at first only glimmered shall gradually become a flame. The blood of the bad shall flow over your surface, but you must not absorb it. At last, the poisoned animals shall eat and die of it. All the stories that have been written in praise of the princes and priests shall be committed to the flames. Thenceforth, your children shall live in peace. When she had finished speaking, she sank down. The Maggie, who had not understood her, shrieked out, I have asked you if I should become master of all the lands and people of Freya, and now you have been speaking to another. Frana raised herself up, stared at him, and said, before seven days have passed, your soul shall haunt the tombs with the night birds. 
and your body shall be at the bottom of the sea. Very good, <clears throat> said the Maggie, swelling with rage. Say that I am coming. Then he said to his executioners, throw this woman overboard. This was the end of the last of the mothers. We do not ask for revenge, time will provide that. But a thousand, thousand times we will call with Freya, watch, watch, watch. That's all for tonight. I will see you next time. Please don't forget to click like.